So these are my uh, disclosures. I do consult for Arthrex mostly on the minimally invasive uh, applications, but uh, no conflicts with regards to this presentation. So I just want to start off briefly, what is 3D printing? I think it's, um, it's getting out there and a lot of people have a much better sense than they did even five years ago about what this means. Um, but it has a lot of different names and people will talk about stereolithography or rapid prototyping, but by far the most common is, is the 3D printing concept. Um, and it's a general concept that is additive manufacturing, but you're able to create really complex objects that um, you couldn't do with traditional manufacturing techniques uh, such as casting or molding. So trying to create this object on the, on the bottom right would be very challenging um, unless you're able to print it layer by layer. Um, and there are a lot of different techniques for doing this. And I'm just gonna show the one that's used most commonly with uh, orthopedic applications, which is this powder binding. And the powder could be you know, metal and then they can uh, heat it uh, and sort of laser center it, or it could be um, other types of uh, powders that they could glue together. But you lay down uh, sequential layers and then you have something that binds it together. And then you create this object uh, as you're printing it and it's moving down uh, through the sequential layers here until you get something um, in, in this bed and you can take it out and now you have this object, which would otherwise be very challenging to make. Sorry. So we wanna do something that's gonna help our patients. And so we need to think about doing this in for metal replacements for bone defects or bones or what have you. And we're gonna use the same techniques, but of course we're gonna be doing it based off of CT scans. So the first step in all of this, and I'm gonna showcase it in a second, but the first step is you have to get high quality CT scans. And then what the, um, the companies will do is highlight the bones that you're interested in. You can see this in the purple here. This is in um, a system called uh, Materialize. And then it creates a 3D model in the computer. And so this was a study that I was working on as a resident looking at um, coalitions uh, in the hind foot. But just so you can see kind of what this looks like in the computer, very high resolution of, of, the, um, of the bones, which then gets converted in the system and then sent to the 3D printer. Press that. And so this is what the final processing looked like for this particular uh, case. And then you end up with the final print. And so this was a study we were doing with sort of bio models. And this was a um, silicon powder that got sort of glued together. So what we're doing in, um, in clinical practice, I was trying to create metal implants. And um, so along those lines, I wanna share two cases. Um, the first, and this was my first case of using this, was a 20 year old woman, uh, restrained passenger versus car, NBC, and she had a tailor body extrusion. And you can see on the x-ray there, there's a, a small wafer of the head that's left. Um, but unfortunately the tailor body itself was not recovered. Uh, and so she was left uh, here, she was treated elsewhere, uh, placed into an X-fix and antibiotic cement spacer and, uh, and cleaned out. And then she had seen several other uh, surgeons who had offered her either some sort of bulk allograft fusion, so with a femoral head perhaps, uh, with a, either a TTC or pan-tailor fusion. Um, somebody uh, recommended a, a primary amputation for this. Uh, but she was a young, young girl. Uh, she works as a security guard and she was looking for other solutions. And so she came in and we talked about um, what other options she might have uh, after being in the experts for two months. Um, so I started off with just a standard sort of infection workup. We looked, uh, you know, the skin was well healed, no erythema, no significant swelling. I aspirated her several times. We gave her a pin hole. I actually aspirated her again at that surgery to take the X-fix off. Um, and then we, we obtained bilateral CT scans. And so this is, what, um, this is what it looks like. So we send it off to a company. They parse both of the CT scans. And here's a little video showing. This is actually my first uh, time using a Zoom conference. Um, 
But here you have the engineer showing me what this uh, implant will look like. And so in this case, the gray that you see is her injured side. And then the green is a mirror image of her um, uninjured talus. So they, they parse that and then they just take a mirror image of it. Uh, and they're showing me slightly different sizes. They'll give you, you know, a, a true size and a, you know, 0.95% uh, size. So that you can try and get it in if it's a little bit tighter. Um, and, and, and they go through it. So you, you're working with the company, you're working with the engineers to try and describe what, what it is that you're looking for here. Um, and in this case, uh, we were trying to do a, a total tailless replacement. And so they're going to take this image file and then they're going to print it out in, into a metal uh, format for me. So this is what uh, it looks like. It's like a liquid metal, like the uh, Terminator 1000 from the, from the movie. Um, but <clears throat> they send multiple different sizes here. And then they also send uh, trials. So on the left, you can see the trials that you can uh, correspond to the same uh, sizes here. And then you can, um, as you're doing the surgery, you can see here we came direct the interior. You, we found the um, cement you can see on the left there. And the, the, what was left of her tailor head uh, was almost just the subchondral bone. And it just came out, um, it was almost mush at that point, um, but fortunately uh, was not infected. Um, and you can see we're trying, trialing it with the, uh, with the first trial. And you can see it fits in uh, nicely. Um, and then this is the final implant you can see uh, uh, inside uh, and fits nicely. And it's really just a spacer. So you know, we know that the, the tail doesn't have any muscle attachments. It obviously has some ligamentous attachments, but in her case, she had had the cement spacer in there so long uh, that she almost scarred around it. And so all of her ligaments were sort of bypassing any tailor attachments anyways. Um, and it was remarkably stable once that was, once that was in there. Uh, this is what the um, trials look like, and they usually put a little bit of uh, uh, radio-dense um, powder in there as well so that you can see the outlines better. Uh, and then it's really kind of a feel and an x-ray evaluation and, and looking at it clinically to see, uh, is, it, is it the right size? Does it fit comfortably um, uh, before picking the final option? And this is what she looked like about two years later. Um, and she had been able to walk on it. She did get a little stiff. I had to lengthen her Achilles tendon uh, late, um, but she uh, was able to return to work as her security guard. She's able to walk. She can't run more than a block or so, but she can get around uh, reasonably well. And she has some light soreness at the end of the day and is left with about 30 degrees of ankle motion. Um, just uh, briefly, you know, I think the 3D printed talus is one of the most common ones that's being done right now in the foot and ankle world, most commonly for ABN, which we see a lot of in the trauma world after talus fractures and fracture dislocations. Um, and a lot of this is coming out of Duke right now. So Dr. Parekh and Dr. Sam Adams have, are really at the forefront of this and publishing a, a fair amount on it. Um, but some of the outcomes with 27 patients and having a significant decrease in uh, VAS, although still relatively high in this study, uh, but they're able to maintain their ankle range of motion. Um, and in this case, one person did go on to amputation because of infection. Um, so our midterm outcomes, and some of this is coming out of Japan. And so sort of three to eight year outcomes with ceramic talus uh, is showing improvements in function. And in this one case, no revisions or amputations. Um, and then there are some even further out, 10 to 36 years from Thailand. These are a little bit different because it's just the Taylor body. Um, which I think is not necessarily what's happening as much anymore because some other studies have shown that maybe the implant, the interface between the bone and the implant here uh, was not as good as this particular study was showing. Um, but at long-term follow-up, 28 of 33 were still in place. Um, so my second case is a case of distal tibial non-union. And so this was um, a nurse in my system, 58. She had well-controlled diabetes, uh, my, a little bit of neuropathy. Uh, and then she had a peelon fracture, which was treated um, locally uh, and initially X-fixed and, and staged ORAF uh, as pretty standard, but obviously went on to hardware breakage non-union um, and then uh, other surgeries to remove this uh, hardware. 
But at about a year and a half following her injury, she came to see me um, with this deformity here. And so again, we started with the basic workup and we made sure that she didn't have an infection. She had an open biopsy. Um, and uh, the path came back saying, you know, it looked like uh, dead bone, but all the cultures were negative. Um, again, had been an offered amputation previously. They had talked to her about bone transport. Um, and I talked to her about that too. I'm not really a frame guy, uh, but it, it, I think that's on the table for these types of uh, critical bone defects as well. And uh, she really tolerated the, the frame poorly uh, at the initial um, injury. And I think she even had some pin site infection. So she was not particularly interested in that. Um, and so we talked to her about possibly performing a single stage TTC fusion with this uh, uh, distal tibial uh, cage replacement as well. And so again, you can see the pre-op plan here. Um, the uh, gray is the damaged uh, bone and then the, uh, the white is sort of the overlay of the, um, uh, of the in, intact um, tibia. And then they can model it out for you. So here we're creating a sort of uh, cage that you can customize. Again, we're working with the company engineers doing Zoom calls and they can template around whatever type of nail that you want because they have the image files for all of the common hardware that we're going to use as well. <clears throat> so this was in, uh, her at the beginning of the case. You can see the recurvatum deformity. Uh, we decided to come medially to try and preserve the uh, fibula for some, uh, some stability. And we resected the entirety of that distal um, non-united avascular portion of the tibia. And then this is the spacer that I showed you earlier. We place that right in and we do the reaming and uh, pinning for the TTC directly through um, that uh, spacer. Obviously we've already prepped the subtalar joint as well here. And then here are our uh, implants. Uh, you can see the spacers. And then we, I take a combination of um, you know, DBM and allograft bone, uh, sorry, autograph bone, and really just kind of try and throw the kitchen sink into this to try and get some bony ingrowth to this. Um, <clears throat> and then here it is uh, packed uh, with bone. And then here uh, we're lining it up for the nail. Um, and then this is at the end where we're coming in and you can see it's uh, much straighter here. Uh, being critical, I probably left her about you know, a couple degrees in Aquinas, um, but she's doing well with the rocker bottom. And here's her uh, post-op. She's uh, just about a year out now. Um, so she's CT here. And I think you can see some bones are coming down and infiltrating into this implant here from both sides, coming up from the talus as well. And I do like to get um, a CT scan on these before I let people start weight bearing. Um, it, it just makes me feel better. It makes them feel better knowing that we're getting some bony ingrowth. Um, this is a, a nitinol nail. So there's an elastic uh, nitinol core to this to help con continue some compression uh, even after uh, we're done to keep the bone uh, from resorbing at the edges. So, um, you know, when, when our first talk was mentioning cost, uh, this is gonna blow the, the cost out of the, out of the water for any of your cases. Um, but uh, post-op, she's returned to work. Uh, she's working as an RN, she's walking. She does have rocker bottom shoes, uh, but she's really pain-free for the first time. So for me, this was a big win and she's been uh, quite happy with it. Now, um, disclosure, I'm not a frame guy. This is a, a frame from one of my uh, friends and I showed him this case and he said that he would do this, which is a cable transport diffusion. Um, certainly, uh, I think if you have the techniques and the skill set, this is would be another reasonable option. Um, for, the, for me, I, I prefer the more acute uh, corrections and the single stage procedure if possible, um, but a, a lot of ways to skin a cat. Um, and so from the benef benefits, um, we do know, especially in diabetics, that bulk allograft TTCs rarely, if ever, fuse. And so two studies in the 2013-14 um, showed really 100% uh, of them had non-unions around bulk allograft if there was a diabetic. Um, 
And with the fusion rates around titanium printed cages, uh, we're getting 85 uh, plus percent. And so two studies here uh, with 15 patients, uh, 13 of them went on to have a good outcome, pain-free walking and fusion, and the other two ended up unfortunate with, with amputations. But certainly we're, if we're thinking about doing any of these, we're, we're in the limb salvage uh, uh, world for sure. Um, and this was another study from uh, the same group looking at fusions with allograft versus the metal cages, uh, showing 92 versus 62% uh, overall fusion rates. So uh, who is a candidate? And a lot of people are not. So if you have an infection, if you have poor tissue quality, you're not gonna wanna be putting a lot of hardware in here. Um, but in, in my world, we're doing this for failed total ankle uh, arth uh, arthroplasties, in particular, Taylor AVN, as I showed, and then segmental bone loss. So I, I think it's a really interesting and exciting uh, field within orthopedics. It's not just foot and ankle. The tumor surgeons are really having a heyday with this as well. Um, but it's really, it's exciting because it's really only limited by your imagination and what you can think of and how you might want to uh, improve people uh, and get fixation into these complex situations. There are multiple companies that you can use it that do really good work. And I've listed some of them here. Um, and certainly uh, these are salvage procedures. And I often think of them as maybe the best option out of a lot of bad options for patients. Um, you know, I, I never want to do this. It's intellectually interesting and, and they're exciting cases to do. Um, but if I have another option, I, I definitely try to do it for them as opposed to a 3D printed uh, uh, bone or replacement. But uh, I encourage you to look into it and, and see if there's options for your patients as well. Thank you. That is some pretty cool stuff. What's the turnaround for a, that Talus? Uh, so it depends on the uh, company that you're working with. Uh, so the the Restored 3D is the one I, I use. They have a turnaround of three to four weeks from when they um, from when you send them the image files. It's just a standard CT, or is there anything special about it? Um, I mean, fine fine cuts. So just the highest highest cut, uh, thinnest cut mm -hmm. that you can get for that. Um, and obviously, it needs to look the entire area that you're evaluating, but um, Oftentimes I'll send them bilateral CT so that we can compare, especially if there's been shortening or collapse of the talus on one side, mm -hmm. then um, you'll need to model it off the other side. Yeah, it's sort of interesting that, uh, as noted, you know, replacing uh, artificial talus, so to speak, isn't a, isn't a new idea. I mean, you know, it, it, there's 36 year follow up. <laughs> so, um, and I remember being a resident and, and reading an article about this and going, this is craziness, but uh, um, it, it's an interesting concept. And it, it's interesting to see how well uh, does the uh, articular surfaces of the, of the ankle and, and the subtalar joint hold up to, you know, something that's obviously much harder and different than what's sure. supposed to be there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, I think that's the question everybody has. And, and there are certainly um, surgeons who are very critical of this type of procedure out there because, I mean, what's after you do a total talus replacement, what's your fallback, right? You're talking about doing a, a pan tailor fusion, which arguably has worse functional outcomes than a baloney amputation. Um, so it's, and, and that's where I talk to people about this being an option that has, if it goes poorly, can have serious ramifications. Um, and so I think it's not something you do casually, ca casually uh, for patients. Um, now we have people with 30 year follow-up with some of these ceramic talus. Um, and, you know, I think with some of the 3D printed technology, we can get much more exact replication of the patient's anatomy which I think can only be a good thing. Well, I think this was a really, really cool. Um, you're talking about cost, but the cost of that um, fusion construct is really driven by the Dyna nail. I mean, that's expensive, but 
you know, a right run of the mill hind foot nail. And that fusion construct is considerably less than that cable co- cable transport construct you were just showing. Right. And that's that, that ain't cheap either. No, no well, and, and <laughs> yeah. when, once you're getting to that point, I mean, there's probably no cheap options. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, the foot and ankle surgeons are sometimes a little, uh, you know, inelastic to cost concerns and the trauma guys are, are often hounding on us for that. Um, but then they're putting on complex frames and doing cable transport for, for similar conditions. And so, um, you know, if you're comparing it to that, it, it's, uh, it's probably cheaper. Um, yeah. Certainly it's simpler for the patient, you know, you know, they don't have to monitor. I think so. It's simpler for the surgeon too, because I mean, you get to monitor that cable transport like a hawk. So, uh, Max, Jeff, any comments or any questions? No, no questions. It's it's always mind boggling to see these types of cases. I'm I'm been very hesitant to to jump on it just because it, for the same reason that I don't do hip and knee replacements, which is that once you start putting metal in, I feel like you just have to chase metal with metal. Um, but at, at some point there may be a, a need to do it. So I'm, I'm curious to see, um, Chris, what, what you and other people, there's a lot of promise and certainly that's where we're going. I just haven't been comfortable enough yet. So thanks. Yeah. Chuck, uh, Dr. Man, I, I've done a, I've done a few cages, you know, 3D printed cages for bone defects and stuff. Have you done some? One, literally. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is I can never tell, and, and, and Chris, you kind of went into this, but it's hard to tell when it's healed. And I've seen some hypertrophy on the, because um, usually metaphyseal defect and distal tibio distal femur. And I've, I've seen that hypertrophy of the cortical bone on the uh, more proximal junction, mm-hmm. but I never know what's going on in the metaphyseal junction um i haven't seen much happening there so it's i've always i just let them weight bear when they can but i've never really i haven't gotten cts before weight bearing but that's a good idea but that's always been tough for me to be like, is it really healed or not healed sometimes it's a leap of faith because i think even in that one i showed you you know it's, it's hard to tell how much the the talus may may be binding to it um but, you know, I just try to pack as much bone as I can in there. And, um, you know, in that case, I really left as much, uh, you know, I came down to periosteum and, and kind of shelled the bone out to try and leave as much of that to, you know, hopefully uh, bind to the sides as well. Well, okay. That was a great session. Um, very much appreciate your time, gentlemen. And uh, I hope the COA members enjoy this. Uh, And I think that we're finished.